Hello, and welcome to the 2023 Charleston Conference Session, Building Diverse Streaming Video Collections, Library and Small Vendor Collaborations. This session will explore the landscape for streaming video collection development, highlighting the perspectives of a content distributor and librarians working together to make niche and specialized video content available for educational use. Your speakers for this session will be Evgenia Konstantin, the head of social impact for the distributor Odyssey Impact, Amaury Serrano, the central collection development librarian at Yale University Library, and myself, Michael Fernandez, the electronic resources acquisitions librarian at YUL. Briefly outlining this session, Evgenia will first cover the vendor perspective, describing how shifts from physical to streaming formats have impacted content distribution. Next, Amaury will offer insights into how sourcing content from smaller distributors supports mission-based collection development. Finally, I will wrap up the session by covering the technical services lifecycle and workflows specific to managing content for smaller distributors, with a focus on locally hosted collections. And now I'll turn it over to Evgenia to provide the vendor perspective. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. I hope this conference finds you all healthy and safe and in good spirits. My name is Evgenia Constantine, and I am the head of social impact at Odyssey Impact. Odyssey Impact is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City that creates and leads national social impact campaigns for award-winning documentary films. In my role, I lead the impact department and team and spearhead strategy, execution, and distribution for all of our films and social impact campaigns. Our process for creating an impact campaign and its distribution always starts with the film. The films that Odyssey Impact creates social impact campaigns for are centered on urgent social justice issues. These films are either created and produced by Odyssey Impact or through acquisition from film festivals or submissions to our organization. Each film's campaign involves a strategic phase where we work with key stakeholders aligned with the issues uplifted in the film and those who are directly impacted. The strategy phase includes the creation of custom-made resources to complement or supplement what is presented in each film in the form of a digital screening toolkit packed with resources such as fact sheets and discussion guides. Once an impact campaign launches, we host a launch event and often invite librarians and college and university faculty members who teach courses aligned with the themes in the film. We then conduct proactive outreach to libraries, educational institutions, nonprofit orgs, houses of worship with elected officials and influencers, inviting them to join the campaign and acquire the film and resources. Impact campaign goals can vary for each campaign, but they all have the goal of raising awareness shifting attitudes and inspiring action around a particular cause or issue. Here are a few examples of our portfolio films that we offer at Odyssey Impact. As I just mentioned, the films are all centered on urgent social justice issues, including racial justice, gender-based violence, reparations and reconciliation, gun violence, mental health awareness, mass incarceration, and the cash bail system in America. The distribution model for each film varies depending on the rights that we have to offer for each film. If it's a film that we created and produced, we have more options in terms of the rights that we can license versus a film that we did not produce but are creating an impact campaign that may already have a previous distribution deal. It is ideal for us to produce or acquire a film where multiple windows of licensing can be offered. Now I'm going to walk you through changes to our methods for distribution. And to do that, I'm first going to share a little bit of background. Um, our distribution model for our films and impact campaigns prior to COVID-19 included offering films on DVD, Blu-ray, or via time-sensitive digital links. The reason we needed several methods is because we offer multiple ways to license our films. At the college and university level, some institutions opt to purchase public performance rights for our films for faculty members, uh, where we would offer a film for a one-time screening event in a class or for the campus community. 
other institutions opt to purchase the film to add to a library collection. In March 2020, as we as an organization began to work from home, we realized we needed to quickly pivot and adapt to new distribution methods as the mailing of hard materials was no longer a viable option for us or the organizations we were working with. So we conducted a comprehensive landscape analysis to determine the best option for us to shift to an all digital model. We surveyed our network and we had one-on-one -on -one sessions with faculty and librarians that we had worked with in the past. During this process, we discovered a challenge. We were not large enough of an organization to have all of our films available through Canopy and seemingly no one system worked for all of our potential partners. We needed a system that would allow us to offer public performance rights, limited window purchases, life of format purchases, and a system that would allow us to send not only the film file, but the screening toolkit, a system that met our budget and that allowed for ease of access for our network. What we landed on and shifted to was an all digital model using the platforms Indie.tv and Vimeo that allowed us to offer our films in a way that could be downloaded and uploaded to secure systems. The shift to an all digital model actually simplified our business model and we've received positive feedback from our partners over the past few years in terms of ease of access. However, because we offer films that have different levels of distribution status based on whether we created and produced the film, we can often have challenges in creating awareness for our content. On this slide, I included a few examples to highlight how the difference in distribution that we offer can impact our reach. Run for His Life is a film that we created and produced and one that was acquired by GQ Sports. Because the film was acquired by GQ Sports, they opted to make the film free on their official YouTube page. This has been great for reach, but it did limit our ability to make it available for purchase. The film Trapped Cash Bail in America is a film that we did not produce, but we created and produced an impact campaign for the film. This is a YouTube original film and has garnered several million views, which is incredible, but it can be hard for us to track the direct actions taken by those who have watched it. Where on the other hand, Healing the Healers is a film series that we created and produced and created an impact campaign for, and it's a film series for which we maintain all the rights. This means that we are the point people, the direct contact for everyone who purchases the film series and acquires it. And we can follow up and hear about the impact the series has had, which is very important for our work. These are examples of our different strategies and tactics for marketing and outreach to libraries and academic institution, uh, among other outreach targets. We conduct direct outreach to faculty and acquisition librarians. We have also placed targeted ads. We send e-blasts to our network and often purchase lists that align with our target audience groups that are film and campaign specific. We attend conferences such as the American Library Association conference that took place this uh, past summer in Chicago, Illinois. And we often host virtual events for librarians and invite them to preview our films, hear from a panel, including the directors, those featured in the film, myself and my impact team at Odyssey Impact. If a film has a distributor that we are working with, such as GQ Sports or YouTube, there are often multiple benefits. For example, we can build advertising stipulations into our agreements, which can boost our marketing support, maximize reach and increase access. However, there can be cons to partnering with other streaming platforms as well. For example, as I mentioned before, it can be hard for us to track the impact the film has had and the resources and discussion guides can sometimes get lost in the shuffle. This is why each partnership is unique and must address our goals for each uh, campaign and for the film. When we at Odyssey Impact as an independent distributor work with libraries, it can often be mutually beneficial to have a dialogue about our licensing process to determine what works best for the library. We like to assess who the purchase is for. If it's for a specific faculty member who requested one or more of our films for a film screening or showing in class or on campus, the limited timeframe purchase option that includes public performance rights and access to our resources might be the best option. If it's a purchase for the library to add to their collection, it's typically an outright purchase for life of format. We also offer limited windows for streaming. We also like to establish what system they use. 
In other words, how will the film file be made available securely to current students, faculty, and in some cases, alumni? Since platforms can vary, we like to have a conversation to determine the best and most secure method for delivery. The best system so far has been to offer downloadable files of the film that can be uploaded to a secure system that offers access to students, faculty, and beyond. Thank you so much for listening, and now I will pass off to Amaury. Yale University Library's collection development philosophy guides how the library builds, organizes, preserves, and provides access to its general collections. It was revised in 2021 to align with the library's revised mission statement and strategic directions, which emphasize community, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. The philosophy highlights the library's commitment to diversify and make collections more accessible, and it informs collection development priorities in the subject, collection, and format levels, including video. The library has a large, diverse physical media collection, most of which is housed in the Yale Film Archive, as well as a growing number of perpetually purchased streaming films. The collection covers an array of film genres and categories and is international in scope. In addition to owned video content, users at Yale have access to subscribed streaming video content from large streaming providers such as Canopy. The video collection supports teaching, learning, and research at Yale and provides the library community access to a large, diverse, and long-standing media collection. Subject librarians are actively developing the video collection in two areas that are tied directly to DEI. World cinema that is underrepresented in the video collection, especially non-Western, and US-focused DEI-related films, primarily documentaries. In general, the library is looking to expand streaming video access with a preference for perpetual purchases. The library takes a holistic approach to collecting video. The library purchases hundreds of DVDs and Blu-rays annually for collection bu building purposes, often because there are no streaming alternatives. Streaming is the preferred format for course reserves. Many of the films requested for courses are available on streaming provider platforms, but a significant number must be sourced directly from distributors and filmmakers and hosted locally. The library subscribes to streaming video collections and purchases curated thematic collections such as Alexander Street Press's LGBTQ Studies and Video. The library also acquires title by title streaming video in perpetuity by faculty request or selectively for collection building. The library's collection building goal is to move towards proactive title by title acquisition of streaming video, especially in expanding areas of focus. Over the last five years, the library has licensed a significant number of films directly from small independent distributors and filmmakers as a result of faculty requests and course reserves. The content often reflects diverse voices, viewpoints, and regions of the world and allows the library to affirm its commitment to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. These films are often available for perpetual purchase, ensuring long-term access. However, licensing films from small distributors and independent filmmakers can be challenging and time consuming. It isn't unusual to get course reserve requests for films that are not available from known vendors or distributors and require investigative work to identify rights holders via video listservs such as Videolib, databases such as IDV Pro, or even social media. There may be also be language barriers when sourcing films from foreign distributors, filmmakers, because it may be more effective to search in the foreign language in question to more easily identify the rights holder. In general, institutional access to television series is a challenge for libraries, but foreign series are especially problematic because they are often not available streaming in the United States, even on consumer facing platforms and may not be available on DVD or Blu-ray. Theatrical performances can also be challenging, particularly if the faculty member is requesting a specific performance. Even if you identify the rights holder and find contact information, in my experience, they often do not reply quickly, and you may have to send multiple requests before you get a response. Communication and negotiation also pose a challenge. Many of these content providers have never worked with libraries and are unfamiliar with standard collecting preferences and objectives, processes and procedures in the library. They are often unfamiliar with our accessibility needs, 
such as closed captioning and audio transcripts. There may also be language barriers when sourcing films from foreign distributors and filmmakers, in which case you may need to reach out to colleagues with knowledge of the language in question to facilitate the process. Because some content providers have not worked with libraries, they may offer unrealistic pricing based on their experience working with a television network, for example. Content provider licenses can be confusing, odd, incomplete, or not appropriate for academic libraries. The contract between a filmmaker and a company putting on a film festival will be quite different than an academic streaming license. There are also access and discovery challenges related to local hosting and managing access, which Michael will address later in the presentation. In light of these challenges at Yale, we've taken a collaborative approach to sourcing, licensing, acquiring, and providing access to streaming video that is purchased directly from distributors and filmmakers. In this approach, everyone has a role or area of expertise. Subject libraries have subject ex expertise and may have regional and language expertise that are useful when communicating with distributors and filmmakers. The Yale Film Archive staff have video expertise and can advise on collection building or helping to source film. The collection development department helps to coordinate streaming related work across library units and is the primary contact for all large streaming providers and academic video distributors. The e-resources and serials management team has an operational uh, role and oversees ordering, file delivery, local hosting, and discovery. We've also developed a video CD policy that outlines selection responsibilities, selection criteria, and streaming specific considerations. We've created a model streaming license and specialized workflows for acquisition, access, and discovery, which Michael will talk about later. We've also begun to use third-party suppliers and billing agents to source and pay for content, which has improved turnaround time from request to access. The Collection Development Department provides training for subject librarians that acquire or plan to acquire streaming video. Beyond acquiring streaming rights for video, working with small distributors and independent filmmakers is an opportunity for libraries to help them navigate the higher education streaming market, as well as facilitate the work of other libraries that plan to acquire films from these content providers. How can we help? One, provide a general overview of why academic libraries acquire streaming video. Two, describe how users access, view, and use video. Three, share collection development policies and guidelines. Four, provide examples of reasonable pricing for their films. I often include a link to distributor websites with similar content. And five, provide standard licensing terms that they can use in the future. As I mentioned earlier, we have a model streaming license that we share with our vendors, our streaming vendors. I'll now turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Amari. Once selection of content has occurred, the technical services work of acquiring and providing access to streaming video begins. Because small distributors often directly provide video files for local hosting, workflows differ from other e-resource content, where access to licensed content is switched on by the vendor after it has been ordered and paid for. Picking up on the YUL model license agreement that Amaury had mentioned, we like to use it as a starting point for negotiations with distributors because it includes all of our preferred terms of use for streaming video. As a practical document, it's written with an emphasis on clarity and brevity, having plainly stated language and coming in at just two pages in length. By and large, we found smaller distributors to be very responsive to our model license agreement. This is particularly the case when working directly with filmmakers or other small content providers that won't necessarily have a boilerplate contract readily available. Oftentimes, these acquisitions are done by placing terms in email exchanges or agreeing to terms that are posted on the distributor's website. Going through the additional step of executing the model license agreement gives both parties more grounding and security via mutually agreed upon terms. There's also greater opportunity for expansive terms of use when working directly with small distributors. 
For example, the library may be able to include public performance rights in the license, which aren't always included for content licensed from larger vendors. With that said, we do also recognize that PPR may be an additional revenue stream for small vendors, so we try to balance advocating for expansive user rights while at the same time supporting independent distributors. Once video content has been licensed, our technical services staff follows this general workflow for receiving content, providing access, and maintaining access points based on the license term. Next, I'll go over aspects of the workflow that are specific to streaming content that is locally hosted or managed on a library's media platform. Vendor-supplied video files, commonly in an MP4 or MOV format, are usually distributed online through a shared download link or off a file hosting site like Dropbox. Many distributors will also still make a physical copy available, so the DSL may be bundled together with a DVD separately shipped. For libraries that are new to local hosting, the initial question when receiving digital files is, okay, where do I put this? It's highly likely that the solution will be an existing system that is already in use at the library or parent institution. Content management systems such as Kaltura or Panopto are frequently used to host video. Systems like these are primarily used to support the virtual classroom by allowing instructors to record and post lectures. They also provide a ready-made infrastructure for the library to manage locally held streaming video files. Alternatively, the library could leverage streaming video subscriptions from larger vendors, as some provide hosting services via their own platforms. For example, subscribers to Alexander Street's Academic Video Online have the option to use their media hosting service feature to upload and host files. Similarly, Infobase offers cloud hosting of custom content to subscribers of the Films on Demand collection. Libraries uploading content to platforms are responsible for ensuring that the content has been licensed with permissions to locally host granted by the distributor or rights holder, and may be asked to check a box to confirm this at the point of file upload. Finally, other library systems, such as course reserve systems, institutional repositories, or LSPs with a digital repository module may be used for hosting video files. Once locally managed streaming video collections have a hosting platform to call home, there are a number of decisions for the library to make in terms of providing and managing access to this content. First, metadata records may not always be provided for content from smaller distributors. The library may need to do some form of original cataloging work, or more likely, copy cataloging based off a physical material source, such as the DVD record. Backing up a step. The decision as to whether or not the content is made discoverable in the first place can vary according to use case. Short-term DSL content, sometimes just licensed for one or three year terms, may not get added to the catalog or discovery layer. This is because the maintenance of adding access points, tracking term expirations, and then removing those access points may be taxing on staff bandwidth, particularly at libraries with smaller tech services shops they may instead opt to provide the link directly to their questing instructor or only place it in the course reserve system for use solely within a particular class. The content could still be discoverable for users navigating within the locally managed platform, in which case metadata can be added directly for hosted files. At a minimum, this would likely include a title, a description, creator information, and subject tagging in some cases. Many platforms also allow for the inclusion of a custom thumbnail image. At YUL, we typically use a title screenshot or an image from distributor provided promo material for our thumbnail images. Depending on the platform, there may also be options for granularity and regulating access. Some platforms allow administrators to set sharing permissions so that only specified authorized individuals or groups can access a video. In a course reserves use case, a group could be created based on class enrollment, limiting use for only individuals in that class. Or once a hosted video file is uploaded, the link can be set to only be active to authorize users during a specified time expiring at the conclusion of the DSL term. Setting a video's availability through the link expiration in the platform's admin backend, as seen here, is straightforward. Manual removal of files from a locally managed platform may still be required. 
Many license agreements for, for short-term DSLs specify that the file be removed or sometimes deleted entirely from locally managed networks at the conclusion of the license term. Naturally, tracking the term expiration entails an additional management challenge for libraries, particularly when locally hosted titles are used for a specific course. To ensure that access to a certain title does not expire midway through the semester it's needed in, a best practice is to reach out to the requesting instructor before the semester begins to verify whether the title will be needed again so the DSL can be renewed for a subsequent term. Finally, accessibility is a core value of librarianship, and there are aspects to consider that are unique to locally managed streaming video. Ideally, video distributors should be making captions available for their content. For locally managed files, this often means that supplemental caption files should be requested, with the license agreement stating the distributor's obligations for adhering to accessibility guidelines or failing that, confirm the library's rights to perform accommodations to users with disabilities. There are also important distinctions to be made between captions, subtitles, and transcripts, as they all can aid in accessibility, but in different ways. Subtitles are frequently made available for non-English content distributed in the United States. They are either embedded or burned into the video file itself or supplied as a separate file, frequently known as a sidecar file, that can be uploaded alongside the video file within the platform. Subtitles are certainly helpful from a general user and accessibility perspective, but they fall short because they are limited to textual translations of dialogue, omitting other auditory information such as sound effects and musical cues. Captions encompass all of the audio information in a video. Libraries should be specific to request captions for streaming content. Captions are also distinct from transcripts, which textually describe the actions on screen. While transcripts or subtitles can aid accessibility and are better to have than nothing, libraries should work towards having captions for all content in their streaming video collections. For instances when the distributor does not provide captions, the library can consult with external stakeholders, such as an institutional office of accessibility, to investigate avenues for remediation. There are also third-party vendors who provide captioning services at cost, often charging for each minute of video content captioned. While captioning is often available for streaming video, one area of accessibility that has a good deal of room for growth is audio description. As the name suggests, audio description aids users with visual disabilities by supplying a separate audio track describing the action occurring on screen. Audio description can be challenging for locally managed streaming video files, as most platforms don't allow for the inclusion of multiple audio channels, meaning a separate version of the video may be needed with the audio description integrated into the default soundtrack. For streaming video content in general, the presence of audio description is far less prevalent than captions. As a result, audio description is more often than not procured on request at point of need, and again can be done so through partnerships with accessibility offices or third-party services. While streaming video collections are expected to continue to grow at most libraries, the dominant collection strategy remains a reactive one, with course reserves and other curricular requests being the primary driver. The marketplace itself is another driver, as perpetual or life of file license terms are not typically available for the bulk of streaming content, and rights for short-term license titles often change hands with the titles periodically dropping off platforms. Still, there are opportunities for libraries to build focused streaming video collections, and working with smaller vendors, particularly those who offer life of file DSLs, is one way to grow these types of collections. In addition to growing diverse collections, the library also has the opportunity to build a unique digital archive that subjects their collection strengths, much in the same way that other physical and online special collections do. At YUL, we've grown our locally managed streaming video collection significantly in the last three years. While the initial period of growth was necessitated by the pandemic shift to virtual learning, we are looking to continue building on that foundation, identifying subject strengths, particularly within area studies, where we can pursue more focused and intentional collection building. The growth can be seen in this chart. Starting with just 10 videos pre-2020, the collection experienced an initial surge and has steadily climbed each successive year. This concludes our presentation. We would like to thank you for your time. There will be a brief Q&A period for attendees of the virtual Charleston conference. Otherwise, the presenters can be reached via the contact information on this slide.
Thank you once again.